Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we bring you up close and personal with some of Canada's most exciting and vibrant communities. My name is Christopher Brown, and I'm your host for this exciting journey. Over the course of this series, we'll be sitting down with local elected leaders from communities all across Canada. We will learn about who they are, what drives them, and how they are working to make their communities a better place for everyone who lives there. Now, we on this show believe that the best way to understand a community is to talk to the people who live and work there. That is why we are honored to have our guest onto the show today. Please help me welcome to the show Councillor Louise Wallace Richmond of the City of Salmon Arm in the province of British Columbia. Louise, welcome to the show. Thanks. Hi. So great to be here. So beautiful Louise, sunny day. It and is. The first day of spring. Happy first day so. of spring. Uh, right. let's, let's get the first question out of the way and you're no exception to this first question. Where did your sense of duty to serve come from? Um, I, uh, I'm the daughter of a naval aviator and a nurse. So in my house, uh, service was important. Um, and I've always been, um, quite curious about how the world works. Um, and I guess, uh, self admitted political junkie. So um, I thought municipal politics was a good fit for me and um, it worked out. What was the draw to municipal politics? Because you could have chosen provincial or federal or school board, but at the end of the day, you chose municipal. What is it about municipal that drew you? Um, so, so way, way back in the day, my first year of university, I served as a parliamentary page. Um, at the House of Commons, and I learned a ton about uh, process and uh, legislation and protocol, and I really, really enjoyed that work. Um, it was a great job. I learned so much. Um, and then after I graduated, I spent a little bit of time working uh, on the Hill um, in the office of the Chief Opposition Whip. Um, and it's one thing to serve uh, in chambers and then another thing to to see that other side uh, and so I I was quite young and idealistic and but I didn't really fit like feel like it was a good fit for me the whole sort of partisan piece and uh, um, it's it's hard to explain but I'm very interested in practical politics and I don't always think partisan politics gets us where we need to be. So um, at the time, uh, that was, I guess, late 80s, early 90s, and a lot of people were going west, so I went there too. And then I spent some time working in publishing. Um, it's a lot like politics in that there's a formal process to get things done properly, checking and double checking and um, that sort of thing, you know, consulting and making sure we've covered everything. Uh, and then, so I did that in Vancouver. I got a master's at Simon Fraser in publishing. And then um, just so happened, I was uh, asked if I would like to move to Salmon Arm. And um, so I did that and I kept going in. I did a lot of corporate publishing, marketing and websites and stuff. And the more I got to know my community, the more I thought, uh, I think I could help with, with these things. You know, I served on a lot of boards. Um, I'm good at governance. And so in 2011, I ran, but I lost, which I think was a really, really, really good lesson. Why do you and say that? You're not the first person who has said that the first loss that they got was in more of an educational experience for themselves compared to winning the first time. Why do you think that? Um, because I think a lot of people are drawn to politics or to municipal politics for oftentimes like a single issue reason something irritated them or frustrated them or they're very passionate about a particular thing um, but once you you get to the table you realize uh oh that there's more than just me <laughs> right so you need that major like in our case you need the four votes um, and you also realize you're representing people who didn't vote for you right so um, and then Municipal politics, and I hope you hear this from others, like it's a very sophisticated system because it needs to be. Um, these are complex issues and um, municipal, you know, on, on NBC under the Local Government Act and municipal 
chart like at the charter you you serve a quasi judicial role and so all of a sudden you go from being all fired up about an issue to making sure you you're not subjecting the city to um challenges that uh community members wouldn't want to pay for nobody wants to get sued nobody wants to I, I want to talk. Yeah. I, I want to go back to that first election, that 2011 campaign, because you said something. I want to just challenge you on a little bit. Were you a single issue candidate? Let's 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 just put it out there. <laughs> no, I think I was a a frustrated voter candidate because at the time the community had gone through a very divisive public hearing, um, and it really on what us, what was the issue? Um, well, uh, the big box stores. Okay, and so. It wasn't a 50-50 split. I think it was actually like a 20-60-20 split, but the 20 on either ends were incredibly vocal. There were like five days of public hearings the first time, and then there was another an additional five days the second time. And um, I think by 2011, I was like, well, I got to get in there and do my part, right? And uh, But the community said, no, we actually think the, the council made a very good decision and it was very thorough and, it, you know, it was challenging. And and we, um, that council that served after I lost, really it was a period of, of healing and getting everybody back on track, you know, because sometimes small communities go through um, big city challenges and, uh, you know, everyone knows everyone and, or mostly, and, and so it, it it can be quite hurtful and tense. And, and, and so I really admire that council for sort of putting it behind them and healing and then setting the co- the city on a new course. And in the end, it all worked out just fine. So after that 2011 election, did you ever think to yourself, okay, I had my one shot. I tried it. I wasn't, I'm not going to go back in. Or was there something in the back of your head? Because when I lost my first time, there was something in the back of my head. I'm going to do it again. I'm going to do it again. I could win next time. If I put my hat in the ring, was I, that yeah, like for you? <laughs> I, I think I had a little of both. Like at first it was like, Oh, well, I tried. I'm really grateful for the people who voted for me. Thanks so much, you guys, you know. <laughs> um, uh, and then I kind of put it on the back burner at first. But then it just so happened in my work life, I was spending more time on municipal issues. Like I was doing some board work and, and engaging with council and staff on on how we might be able to get this done, how we might be able to get that done. And the more I did that, the more I understood, wait a minute, there's way more way more to this right um and again i went in all fiery not knowing uh really what the process was so once i kind of got my head around that um i did run again in 2014 it did take a little bit of of convincing but uh it didn't you know it's kind of a twist my rubber arm so i want to go let's let's talk okay then (laughs) Let's talk about that 2014 campaign. What yeah. what educational experience did you take from that 2011 campaign and put it towards that 2014 campaign? Was there more campaigning, more door knocking, or was it doing what you did in the 2011 campaign, but with a little bit more of an open mind and instead of being that frustrated voter, yeah. you are now the person running to be the counselor for everyone. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so I think the 2011 campaign, I, I think I came in saying, look, I'm here. I heard your voices. Our voices maybe weren't represented the way we wanted. Well, let's put put that voice at the table. But by 2014, I was more of the view. Um, it's important to have new, new voices. Uh, you know, incumbents are tough to beat. Um, and I said, I'm not running because I, I have a bee in my bonnet about any particular thing. I just think that, you know, this is a job that I'm applying for. I think I have good, a good skill set. Um, I'm a quick study. Um, and I would, I really think it's time to add one more voice and the community responded to that. So, so that and night- I didn't do, I, I think I did a little bit of door knocking and a little bit of direct mail. I, I got some decent signs. So my, my friends who, some colleagues who were on council so if you're going to do this properly you know make sure you get some decent signs which i you know i kind of wish we didn't have them because they're so awful but they're, they you know, certainly are it's a um, necessary evil but 
Um, and then I did a little bit of door knocking, but I mostly said like, here's who I am. Here's, here's my skill set. I think I could do this. And I think by then I had a better read on the community. And I understood that not everyone's going to agree with me. They just want someone level-headed who's going to, you know, make the best decisions. Because frankly, they don't want to be dealing with all that stuff all the time. I mean, most council meetings for some people, it's like watching paint dry. Like they'll say to me, do you really do this like every week? And I'm like, yeah. And it's great. And it's fascinating. You're like, oh, I love it. To me, you know. <laughs> I Let's I, let's talk about the issues because okay. you 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 talk about you think you thought you had an idea of what the pulse of the community was, but you did do some door knocking in that election in 2014. Were there issues that were being raised at the doorstep that you were not 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 prepared for, but not uh, that you were shocked at hearing that you went, oh, I didn't think this was an issue, but I'm glad someone's talking about it. Because now, if if I am lucky to get elected this time, I'll be able to help address these issues. Yeah. Because unless you go out and talk to everyone, you're not going to know what every issue that yeah. people have are. You know, my takeaway for the very little bit that I did was that people just really wanted to meet someone who wanted to be their council rep. You know, they're like, oh, Louise, you live in my neighborhood? Uh, yeah, I've seen you at the store or the pub and... Are you sure you want to do this? Okay, yeah, I'll support you 100%. They re there's very, you know, it's usually things like snow plowing and roads. and, um, But more than anything, they, they I think what they liked is, well, maybe maybe now I'll know someone, right? You, know. you, you get, a, you are successful in that campaign, 2014 yeah. on election yes. night. Yeah, the blue just, check mark gets put beside your name, though. But ever so ever so slightly <laughs> like but i think a I, win is a win on a win politics is a win, yeah. a win, is a win was, in politics yeah what's that votes. feel like for you oh i mean it was like the best day ever <laughs> i mean it's a nervous wreck and i won by 70 votes so i mean my i think the community said okay louise we're gonna give you a chance right enough people said all right let's try this new person um and and i I always kept that like this is this is your trial run uh show us you can do it and we'll see what happens next time and then the next time i did get a much better result and the most recent time an even better result but you know i'm consistently in the bottom half of people who get elected and i'm okay with that because i feel like i'm confident that the people who vote for me know me they're not just it's not necessarily uh oh i like that sign or or, yeah, you, know. um, you you get elected, you get excited, but you're elected, but then the real work begins. The actual governance part of the job begins. How yes. long does it take to get go from okay, I've done this to what have I gotten myself into now? <laughs> because now I'm making the decisions. Yeah, about twenty minutes. No. <laughs> Well, no, because, you know, when they they, they send you away for training, and in my case, I think my first formal piece was a, a like a lunch and learn with the lawyers. And you realize, oh, boy, oh, boy, right? Sometimes less is more, like I don't have to spout my mouth off at every every single thing. Like, you know, and it, it honestly, it did put some fear into me. Um, and then, you know, I always, that quasi-judicial thing, I think is important, like, um, I've not, no way am I a judge, but there, there are legal aspects around zoning and variances and, um, and those sort of things. It's a big responsibility. So I, I learned, well, I got a couple good pieces of advice. So there was a, I had been doing some work in Northern BC in Fort St. John and a local mayor had said to me, Louise, don't worry about what you don't know. You'll learn that stuff. You're there because of what you do know. So use what you know to get through this part and then you'll be fine you know just listen and learn and then the counselor i replaced because she had she was moving on to another community said uh just will your voice add to the discussion or just break the silence and if it's just going to break the silence then just listen like we really should listen twice as much as we talk i think you and so you those two things together you know it was kind of a bit of a tight rope and and 
we went to council school and I asked a lot of questions. And um, I think one of my innate skill set is I can really read a room and see where things are going or what's happening. And at the end of every council meeting, I didn't want to come home feeling like, oh, I screwed that up or I should have voted this way. Like at the end of the day, I just wanted to be able to sleep at night. And I feel confident that I can't really think of too many decisions. I mean, they haven't all been popular, but I've been comfortable in my analysis and decision and the process that we use to get there. You, you bring up a good point and that is being prepared for council reading your council reports but also not being entrenched in an idea until you make that final decision at the council meeting how important is it for you to go in educated on the issue but not be so cemented in how you're going to vote because you have to hear from your other councillors you have to hear from public hearings and that could ultimately sway you yes and I mean, I guess it comes back to the time that I lost because maybe I misread or misheard what the community was saying clearly, um, or I would have won. Um, and I think that if I had been, if I was the proponent or the community member in chambers, are you know, presenting one way or the other, what I really want is a counselor who's going to consider both sides, right? And so I, I, I do that. Now you're coming up to nine years in office, yes. nine years in office. And I always ask this question to every counselor because you are not going off to Victoria. You're not going off to Van uh, Ottawa when you're doing your job. You are doing your job in your community 24 seven. You yes. may, may not be paid like a MPP or an MLA or MP, but you are in your community. Have you found that balance between being Louise and being counselor Louise? Uh, I think so. I think at first I was maybe a little bit, I had a little bit of stage fright. Like what if someone asked me something at the grocery store and I don't know what the answer is, you know, oh no. <laughs> or what if someone phones me and, you know, freaks out about something and I don't know the answer, but the truth is it doesn't happen that often. And, oh. um, at least it hasn't to me. And if they do, I just say, well, I don't know the answer to that, but if you, send me an email, I'll follow up with staff and get back to you. Like, I think it's about setting expectations for, for yourself. Like I am still human and I do have other jobs and, and a family. And, um, and sometimes if conversations, you know, maybe around the neighborhood campfire, uh, get a little testy, I'll say, you guys know there are things I, I can't talk about. And, and people I won't are okay with that? Oh yeah, yeah. And I won't jeopardize, because I say to them, I don't want to jeopardize the outcome. No, understandable. Uh, because, I appreciate yeah. that honest answer. I want to yeah. I want to turn to segment two because I'm cautious of time and I want to make sure that I do my due diligence. And I want to state, before I ask this question, this is a conversation between myself and the counselor. This is not a motion yes. of counsel. This is not a direction of counsel. This is not a policy no. of counsel. This is nope. her opinion. And I want to make sure mm -hmm. I preface that because we always get Absolutely. emails. Yeah, and I'm not speaking on behalf of I told my council that I was coming to chat with you and, and they were excited because uh, we support each other and um but I I you know when I when I do media interviews I very careful to say if not this is I'm not speaking for council, I'm speaking for myself. And I appreciate that. We seem to always get emails about this question, but I'm gonna ask it because I think it's the yeah. most important one. Yeah, go ahead. Counselor in your opinion, what is yes. the biggest issue facing your community of Salmon Arm as of recording this today? Housing, housing, housing. How so? Um, well, there's a couple of things. So we live in an ecosystem. I mean, housing is human habitat, right? And there's part of the habitat that's at risk. Um, especially in smaller communities, which is emergency and supportive housing. And um, these big city problems now are small city problems. And in addition, and I'm layered on top of that, so like if you think of housing as a ladder, 
if one of the rungs is broken, it makes it very hard to move to the next rung, right? So oftentimes people who are, um, you know, safely housed in a family home that they've had for many decades, they'll say, well, why is homelessness my problem? Or why is the low vacancy rate my problem? And, and the truth is, because if we can't provide enough entry-level housing, um, especially for young families or young professionals who are um, migrating away from urban centers, many of whom have come during COVID, um, how do they get up the ladder so that when it's your turn to sell your house and downsize to a, a condo or, or some sort of assisted care arrangement, they won't be there. Right. And so as much as we think about housing, we automatically think about homelessness. Really, we're, we need to be thinking about the whole ecosystem. Um, and I think a lot of communities are stuck like that entry level rental apartment. Um, legal suite piece is, is, is a bit stuck. So that's something, you know, and then municipalities will say, well, housing isn't our, it's not our deal. We don't build houses, it's provincial jurisdiction, federal jurisdiction, go talk to those people. But the truth is we, we do manage the flow of, of permit and zoning and official community plan. Um, and we can do that and we can do it well. And I think on balance, it's, it's going very well. But the other thing that's challenging in smaller communities is builders tend to want to build single family homes. That's what they're good at, right? I won't surprise you to learn that most communities of salmon arm size don't have that many apartment building builders. There might be one or two. Um, now, just to, just to jump in on that question, yeah. that statement there, because I want to make sure I get this on the record here. You're right. Developers do not want to build apartment buildings in smaller communities. But on the flip side of that, your community, there may be that nimbyism in the in the whole issue where yeah. people might say, I don't want a, an apartment building. I want, I don't even want growth. I like the size of our city the way it is. Yeah. How yeah. do you, how do you find that balance? And has your council been able to find the balance between growing the city, building that ecosystem for homelessness and adding more additional housing units for people to live in, but also sustainable growth where people who are not in favor of it go, I'm comfortable with the pace that the growth is happening. Yes. And they're comfortable with the pace that it's happening because they feel secure in their arrangement. Right. But in 10 years and 15 years, when it comes time to downsize and they might find themselves wanting to be in a level entry condo, right. Or something like that. Um, that supply needs to be there. So, um, and I, I think it's I think it's even more impacted by the fact that Salmon Arm was the fastest growing community in 2017. And then we just had another burst after after COVID. So uh, people want to come here, but they can't find a place to stay. And and so we're scrambling with that. Meanwhile, we also have sort of entry level housing issues because senior levels of government have never thought that the salmon arms and the enderbees and the sick mooses of the world would ever need a shelter, never mind supportive housing, right? So we're, we're trying to, you know, you're trying to, it's almost, I think the danger is trying to use the same fire hose to put out three different kinds of fires, right? And I, in Salmon Arm in 2018, we, we established a housing, a community housing task force because Everyone was talking housing, 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 but nobody was talking to each other. So we brought in, convened a table, uh, myself and my colleague, Tim Lavery, as co-chairs. We brought in the manager of the local credit union, some realtors, some builders, uh, some social development agencies, some economic development agencies. And we, we worked together to sort of get a better group understanding of what that ecosystem looks like and where investments are needed versus where um, where we have to advocate for more support. And so we have had success on several levels, but it's almost like we're still a tiny bit behind. Like we, we just catch our breath and then we get another uh, bunch of people, you know, which, which we're, we're grateful to have. We need young families and they're coming. Um, is so the, is developing keeping pace with the 
the issues that are going on with inflation and the cost of doing business because I think there's a lot of communities the size of Salmon Arms and uh, uh, even here in Alberta and Manitoba and Saskatchewan where I do a lot of my shows, they're saying the exact same thing. People want to come to our communities, but developers aren't building because we are seeing this inflation rate so high that they can't mm -hmm. build for the same cause that they were building five, yeah. ten years ago. Yeah, it's. I think it's way more challenging to capitalize a project now than it was even, say, two <laughs> years ago. Uh, we have a number of multifamily developments on the books ready to go, and um, they'll come eventually, but uh, it might take more time. And, and you have to respect that. I mean, builders can't build if they can't get financing, um, or builders can't build and price and then all of a sudden have the price of plywood go through the roof and, and the cost of financing go through the roof. So, um, you know, these frictions, it's part of life, but I, I think friction is important because it kind of makes people rethink, okay, what if we did this instead? Or what if we did that instead? Or what if we did townhomes instead of a single family? What if we do, um, you know, this new idea of modular offsite construction? Like not a mobile home, but some houses are being built off-site and then being brought in and placed. And they're quite modern and very attractive. So um, I think we're going to see more of that. So we really try to encourage density. Um, you know, legal suites, uh, townhomes, uh, density bonusing. If Instead of building 18 units, you build 21. We'll give you a break on parking, that kind of thing. Um, and it it doesn't take, the other thing about in a smaller community is if someone builds 20 homes, that's huge. That's like 400 homes in Vancouver, right? Like you have to think about measures. Of, so in the last few years, we've been really lucky in terms we've exceeded what our expectation or our budget was for development. Um, and now, uh, these things go in cycles so residential goes up and the jobs a little bit then commercial comes up and so that's kind of what we're seeing now but i still think we've made the case that we're an attractive place to build and we're we have interest from developers who have done this in other places like vancouver island or Kelowna or now you are a city and this yes. is the city of Salmon Arm, which yeah, is kind yeah. of weird because like for this, like the, 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 the makeup of cities and towns in British Columbia is a lot different than it is in Alberta, but for a city, your size, you're talking about housing, which I think is a big issue across the, uh, mm -hmm. uh, pr across the province of British Columbia, even across Canada. Are you dealing with a lot of provincial issues? Because you talked earlier on when you talked about how housing might not be seen as a municipal issue but when i talk to other mayors in your area or councillors in your area they're talking about that but they're also talking about issues like healthcare, education yeah. how often is your job particularly in a rural city and i say rural city because you're not yeah. in the downtown no. metropolitan of cal uh, of, of vancouver how often yeah. are you dealing with provincial issues that you as municipal council have to address or even talk about and that takes away from the day-to-day -day operations of how you're dealing with what the city issues are yeah and i i mean i think our biggest quote-unquote non-city issue is really advocating for social supports around housing um, so the city of Santa Ana will not, will, won't build a shelter, won't build a um, supportive housing um, because those budget envelopes exist at different tables, right? So to, to ask a city, any city, to, to kind of go rogue and go on their own, you're basically taxing people twice for the same, the same work. However, we can build relationships with you know, BC Housing and the Ministry of Social Development and Poverty Reduction, um, which we have done um, because I will give credit to my, my council. You know, our approach is, is not a combative one. I personally don't feel like much has ever come out of anger and outrage. It's not a very, it's not a winning strategy. Um, these are 
challenging relationships that are sometimes have quite a lot of friction, but in the end, we all want the same thing. So I love how you're giving the most political answer to the most political <laughs> question I've ever asked on this show. And I appreciate you taking time well, to well, even no, answer. It, Go ahead. Yeah. And so, so we can't, I mean, I, I'm not, I, 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 we can do it. I know we can do it. Um, but I also know that we're not going to get it done if we trash talk senior levels of government. It's not going to happen. Um, not because their feelings are hurt, but because they're much more likely to deal with communities that are willing to play ball and, and we are willing to play ball. But we also have had firm, a firm stance that the city of San Juan does not deliver social services, nor do you want the city of San Juan to deliver social services. I mean, we don't know anything about that. We know fire hydrants and 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 light standards and road road standards and sewer and water like we're not we're not the subject experts however we will champion you we will we will go go to the mattresses for you as they say uh to the ministries to get that support but um you know and so that is a tough conversation to have um especially in this very socially there's a lot of social um dysfunction right now i don't i can't i'm trying to find a nice word but it's the hyperbolic partisanship that we currently yeah. live under and yeah. municipal politics is not set up for that and i and i mean that with all respect because like you don't have opposition parties and like you do in some cities in yeah. british columbia but overall you are eight people, nine people, or however many people around that council table working for the city, working yeah. for the best of the city, not Absolutely. working against the party across from you. You're working for the city. So yeah. I can we imagine. We sit in a half circle. We don't sit across. I mean, even just the the figure, the configuration of chambers versus that of like a house or a legislature, you know, it's very oppositional. And we sit in a half circle and our community sits with us and, you know, and staff are between us and, and members of the gallery and they're the subject experts and they're looking at us saying, well, what direction do you want to go? You let us know and we'll do that. So I want to turn to the people's issues now, because if I yeah. go talk to the people of Salmon Arm and I guarantee you, if I talk to a hundred people, they will all give me a hundred different issues that they believe are the most important to them. Now, your job as councillor and mayor and council is to take those issues and bring them together and try to figure out how to move the city forward, but also yeah. how to not leave people behind. Yeah. Have you found that balance? And how do you believe your role as councillor and council is to take the issues, whether it be a pothole, whether it be a park upgrade, look at them, and then try to decipher where the money's going to go because at yeah. the end of the day you have to decide where the money goes and then administration is the one who does it how do you do that and how does this council do it well i think i think there's a lot of important conversations about what we want and what we need right and and we all want uh, a lot of things so uh, over the last 18 months to two years, the city's been working through a strategic planning process. I mean, so my short answer is prior proper planning. So with community input, and, and pretty good community input at that. We have Are people engaged in Salmon Arm? Big pardon? Are people yes, engaged? Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I would say the people who are engaged are very engaged. I still wish more people would come to council and more people, um, one little sort of, I don't know what I would call it. Fun fact is if I see people um, very animated, say on social media about something and they tag me uh, in a post, which sometimes happens, um, I'll just say, hey, here's my phone number. Here's my email. Give me a call. Let's let's try and work, work through this together. And I've been doing that for almost nine years and no one has ever phoned or emailed as a result of those interactions, right? Because sometimes people are reacting. They're just having a moment. They want to react and down or sad face or mad face. They're not interested in responding. Like ultimately, they're like, no, that's your job. You just do it. I'm just pissed off right now. And, right? So, um, and so the strategic plan, which had good input from the community and from a lot of our partner groups, is really lays out short-term, medium-term, long-term. And 
And a lot of our budgeting process, long-term financial plan, any kind of major bylaw reviews that are coming up are, are, are really grounded in, in a proper strategic plan. And not all communities have them, uh, but I know for Santa Ana, it's been a really invaluable tool to the point that we actually had to start it earlier because the last strategic plan, almost all of the boxes were like tick, 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 done, done, done. It's, it's amazing how well a good plan works. <laughs> It certainly is. Um, yeah. I want to end on this last question before we move to the next one. And it's more of an overarching question here. If I was to come talk to you at the end of 2023 and I say, hey, counselor, remember when we had that amazing conversation earlier this year and you said by the end of this year, you hope to have X done because or even started or talked about what would issue X be for you, not as counsel, but as counselor Wallace, what would be that issue for you? Yeah, I mean, I guess. I guess I'm a big believer in metrics. Like what you don't measure, you can't fix, right? And so- Amen to that, sister. <laughs> right? Here's my here's my metric. I would like at the end of 2023 to see that more housing starts in multifamily than single family. Um, that would be, to me, an indication that the shift to density is happening. Um, of course, I don't control all those variables, but but- I can I can see I can, I can see it. I know what's out there. The other thing I would want is to have successfully worked with social development partners to get a 24/7 365 shelter. I don't control all those variables, but I certainly will not give up <laughs> saying, you know, we need this, you know, we can do it. We we have a provider, we have a funder. Uh, we can find some land. Um, we have a great social development workers who get like zero credit for the work that they do. Like if anybody should get, be getting medals and and celebrations and accolades, it's the people who work in social services, but they don't like that kind of feedback. So they just do their work and, and change people's lives. And it's like, we don't even know they're there. But um, so those would be the two metrics for me. Uh, and then the, the other conversation around town is a lot around um, active transportation. So changing the way we move around the city. We're just finishing up a very expensive um, underpass under the main line, CP Rail main line. It took a long time to get to that decision. It's almost finished. And I think it will be transformative in terms of how people move around downtown core and then i want to build on that momentum so that we can extend those tendrils out so you know more cycling more walking more transit so well i appreciate you answering those questions and i yet again i'm cautious of time here so i want to yeah, turn to sure. our last segment here and this think, the, think... the last segment is my best is my is my favorite segment because i like to <laughs> ow i like tourism ow. i i like traveling to communities like salmon arm I've said, if you come on my show, I'm coming to spend my hard-earned economic dollars in your community. So I will be in Salmon Arm later this year. So as a tourist, okay. as people yes. who have who listen to the show looking for places to go in Canada, what are some of the hidden gems in Salmon Arm that you would highly recommend? Um, so what might surprise you what I won't say. I'm not going to say it's because of the lake, and I'm not going to say it's because of the mountains around. Uh, because a lot of DC communities have that. All, almost all of us do, right? Um, I think, so we're halfway between Calgary and Vancouver on the Trans-Canada Highway. So for a lot of people, they drive through town, they stop at Tim Hortons, they keep on going. But if you were to turn off the highway and go to the downtown core, there's this really special, compact, um, one of a kind downtown core with about 19, 18 or 19 restaurants, uh, more than half a dozen patios in the summer. Um, you can walk down to the water and go to the, the bird sanctuary. 
Um, we have, uh, we think, nobody's ever been able to confirm or deny it, we have the longest wooden curved inland wharf in North America. Largest wooden? Longest wooden curved inland wharf in North that, America. If that is not the most unique thing I've <laughs> ever heard, I don't know what is. Yeah. That is I, so it to, just, I just need to go see it just right? for that. <laughs> and so it just does a little curve into the lake so you can see the whole lake. And then there's one of only three bird sanctuaries. Um, in the downtown core, we also have a giant treble clef, which we think no one has confirmed or denied it. The large, the world's largest treble clef, because Math uh, Salmon Arm is a music city where the host of the Salmon Arm Roots and Blues Society. There are you know many coffee houses and and concerts, and um, I always tell people in Salmon Arm we party with a purpose. Like, what well, there's always some kind of fundraiser with a band, and it's not just for the sake of having a band and making money it's it's we're going to get a band and we're going to dance and we're going to make a ton of money for the trail alliance or or the hospice society or the you know, there, there's a a real uh in fact we're working on a strategy just around um how important that music component is in seminar a lot of quite famous musicians came from here shuffle oh. demons uh have you heard of the shuffle demons he grew up here. Great Isabel is a gospel singer from Please here. Please tell me you have a big giant sign that says welcome to Salmon Arm and then it lists every single one of the artists <laughs> that came because I well, love we those signs. Have, we, yeah, we <laughs> do have, so Roots of Blues will often have the sign. And if you were to come this summer, the third weekend of August, just saying, um, we will have Sarah McLaughlin and Blue Rodeo, um, Five Alarm Funk. I don't know if you've ever seen Five Alarm Funk, but they will change your world. Um, and there is a, there is this sort of celebratory quality around music. Um, and I think it's helped us. It was terribly missed during COVID. And now that it's back, it's back with a vengeance. We have this brand new, beautiful uh, Song Sparrow Hall, which is like world, like world standard acoustics. Um, and uh, any band that comes through there like Sloan was here two weeks ago and wow. they just rave about how I know how good the acoustics are so um we also well, have surprised people to learn um you know we have like a, a mini tech cluster they put a thousand people who work in in advanced manufacturing and technology so um and and so sometimes your workforce influences your choice of like culture like in culture is the way we live together right so we like food and we like music and we like dancing and then uh to work off all that stuff we go and walk the trails or um do some hiking do a little paddle boarding you know that kind of thing <laughs> so, so after a long day at work after a long day of council meetings where do you go in town to decompress is there a local watering hole is there a park that you go to just let it all slip away yeah i go with so i live in so Sound Arm is quite big in terms of land mass, like it's second only to Vancouver. Um, so I live in a little part of Sound Arm called Canoe, and we're right on the water. I'm like three minutes from the water. So I'll go down and walk, walk the wharf, I'll walk the beach. Um, and some of my neighborhood friends own Canoe Beach Cafe. So I'll go there and have a beer and some fries and, um, you know, overlook the lake. And uh, that's kind of how. It's kind of a perfect day for me. And then, or I'll walk the trails behind my house and get an epic view of the lake from the top. So, yeah. I'm looking forward to visiting Salmon Arm later. Well, do I, let I, us know and we can give you a little tour. I certainly will. But I want to end my questioning with this one. And it's the million okay. dollar question. Oh. Counselor, in mm -hmm. your opinion, what makes mm -hmm. Salmon Arm such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? You know, I, when I first moved here, so I've lived in four provinces and seven cities. And when I first moved here, what I realized is this place is big enough for me to get what I need, but small enough that people care that I succeed. And that has been my experience in my whole 20 some odd years here. Um, and, you know, Salmon Arm is, is a small city, but it has big ideas. And in fact, that's our, our 
city branding is if you come here, um, we're interested in big ideas, but we're also interested in being a small city. And it turns out you can do both of those things. And I'm very proud to call Salmon Arm home and I'm very fortunate to call Salmon Arm home. So um, I'll leave you with that and maybe you can come and see for yourself. Counselor, I want to thank you so much for doing this, taking time out of your busy schedule to sit down and talk about yourself and the city. I appreciate it when counselors and mayors will do this. And I, I love talking about municipal politics because it's always the forgotten politics of our country. So thank you so much for being part of the democratic process, being part of municipal politics, but being part of your community. It's an honor to chat with you today. Oh, thanks. Well, it's the best job I've ever had. And um, if anyone's thinking out there, in podcast land is thinking about it, uh, you know, look me up. Happy to help. And the links to her will be in the show notes, the website and her Twitter page, because that's how I got connected with her. So awesome. That, and yeah. Well, thank you for what you're doing because you're right. We don't get to talk enough about it. And, and frankly, I agree. It's kind of the coolest part of the whole thing. And where if we disappeared tomorrow, you'd miss us most of all, because it know. would be the first line of government you actually you miss. <laughs> right. Because we like water. <laughs> <laughs> and our garbage picked and up from time to time. And garbage and snow plowing. Yeah, and I could go on. But anyway, so happy so spring and thank you for your time. So with that, I want to remind everyone, put down social media for at least 10 minutes a day and go have a conversation with somebody. Helps our society, helps our democracy, and helps us be a better people. So with that, this has been the cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, just keep talking. <laughs>